The thinking atheist. It's not a person. It's a symbol. An idea. The population of atheists in this country is going through the roof. Rejecting faith. Pursuing knowledge. Challenging the sacred. If I tell the truth, it's because I tell the truth. Not because I put my hand on a book and made a wish. And working together for a more rational world. Take the risk of thinking for yourself. Much more happiness, truth, beauty, and wisdom will come to you that way. Assume nothing. Question everything. And start thinking. This is the Thinking Atheist Podcast. Hosted by Seth Andrews. I can already hear some people wondering out loud, why the hell is Seth talking to a Vietnam veteran about the Vietnam War now? now? I've seen Platoon. We've watched the documentaries. We've read the books. We know our history. Why rehash it now? But I submit to you that the conversation you're about to hear has never been more relevant than it is right now, because it has a lot to do with patriotism and protest. John Musgrave paid a terrible price. I saw his story in the Ken Burns Lynn Novick documentary. It's still on Netflix, The Vietnam War. It's like 10 chapters, 10 parts. It's so good, I watched it twice. And John Musgrave was featured in the documentary. And of all the compelling stories I saw, it was John that leapt off the screen at me. It was so compelling, I reached out to him via his website. And I'm like, look, you don't know me from Adam. But would you ever consider being on the show and talking to me? And he was kind enough to respond and say, sure, let's chat. So we're going to do that. Now, John's not an atheist. I I don't think so. He comes from a a Protestant background. So if you hear any references to his faith or religion or whatever, that's totally cool. I mean, that's not why John and I are talking today. Don't get hung up on any of that. The larger story is one about fighting injustice And because when something unjust and immoral is happening, moral good people have to stand up and protest against it. I mean, talk about relevant, right? We see a lot of that in the headlines right now. Now, the challenge that we've got is that there are whole generations, probably a couple of generations, who know that we fought in Vietnam, who know that we got our asses kicked in Vietnam. But they don't really understand why we were there. Why was the United States traveling 10,000 miles to fight in the jungles of Vietnam? Something to do with communism, I think? Well, I'm going to give you a resource in just a second for those who want to go deeper. But if I had to sum it up, it went something like this. The United States, the pinnacle of freedom, one nation under God. We were in a moral fight against godless communism. And we linked communism to evil. And there was this fear that this spreading communism in Southeast Asia would eventually infect the rest of the world, including us. It's called the domino theory. If Vietnam falls to communism, then holy shit, all the other dominoes are going to fall and communism is at our doorstep tomorrow. And so you got the country of Vietnam divided into North and South, the communist North with Ho Chi Minh. The South anti-communists, we decide to support the South. We start by sending them weapons and training their soldiers. But of course, it's not long before we are shipping soldiers, our soldiers, en masse to die by the tens of thousands in the jungles of Vietnam. The United States acted pretty much on its own because we couldn't get the support of our allies. They thought it was a shitty idea. They thought we had no business being there. And after how many years, at the end of the day, we pulled out of Vietnam, almost nothing had been accomplished, 55,000 plus Americans had been killed, substantially more North and South Vietnamese were dead, and the Vietnam War became one of the darkest chapters of the 20th century. There's actually a whole lecture about the Vietnam War. It gets into this so much better than I do. It's at the Great Courses Plus. It is part of a series called A History of the United States. 
I mean, it's a deep dive into the forces that kind of forged this country. But there's a specific chapter on Vietnam that is really compelling. You know, it gets into French occupation and the pitching of the non-communist southern forces against Ho Chi Minh and then America's intervention. Some would say invasion of Vietnam. It's part of the series, A History of the United States. You can stream that to your computer or via the Great Courses Plus app. It's just one of thousands of lectures on a huge range of subjects. You can stream pretty much anywhere to any device on your schedule. I know that you will love the Great Courses Plus. Do not wait. Now is a really good time to sign up, okay? So start exploring. You get a free trial at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Seth. Remember, thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Seth. This brings me to the story of John Musgrave. And it's one hell of a story that I have asked him to tell. John Musgrave, it's an honor to have you on the show. Well, it's a privilege. Thank you, buddy. I'm uh, going to ask some questions that obviously graze sensitive territory. You determine where we go. Like if you know, we're at All a right. point where you don't want to talk about it, that's your call totally. I just want to throw it out at the beginning, okay? All right. You are a Marine. Can you tell me about why you enlisted in the first place? Well, I was uh, 17 years old, and my country was at war. Like my father and my uncles before me, I felt like uh, the time, if if you believe in your country, you serve it, and the time that your country needs you the most is, is, is in a time of war. I was also a skinny little kid that wanted a shortcut to manhood, and and filled with uh, the images from the TV and the movies and about how exciting it was all going to be. And I was determined to have an exciting life, not a boring one. So it was at all altruistic, but I had grown up wanting to be a Marine. My father had been a teenage bomber pilot in World War II in the Army Air Force. And what I wanted to be first was a waist gunner on my dad's B-17. And when I found out that Dad wasn't flying anymore, and and they weren't using B-17s. I was so disappointed, I I sought another branch, and and I fixated on the Marine Corps. Was your dad proud? Oh, well, uh, he was a good father, so he was scared. He knew what the infantry did for a living, and he knew that I was going to volunteer infantry. You need to understand that for my generation, we grew up with the draft. We were one of the first generations to grow up with it for, for 60,000 of us, cradle to grave. It was in service when I was born, and as I grew up, I knew I owed my country two years of military service, whether I liked it or not, peace or war, it didn't matter. So we had to think about the military as we grew up, because it was waiting out there. And when we were kids, they, they drafted Elvis. And hell, he was the most famous young man in America, in the world at the time. So the draft was always out there waiting for us. And the only choice we felt we had was to choose a different branch. So I had made the decision early on before our war started, before I knew my war had started, that war had been going on most of my life. I did, just didn't know it that I was going to be a Marine. How much did you know about Vietnam before you signed up, really? Uh, When I was in eighth grade, all the news was Laos. Operation White Star, I think it was called. We were trying to to, uh, keep the so-called democratic government in Laos from falling to the path at Lao, the Laotian communist. And then somehow... Within a couple of years, it was it was all about Vietnam. I didn't know squat about Vietnam, and I didn't need to know. I'd, I'd have gone to the land of Oz. I'd have gone to Shangri-La. I'd have gone wherever the Marine Corps wanted me to go. Uh, so I didn't feel like I needed to know much about Vietnam. Uh, by 65, our troops are are in there 
in mass, uh, in units. Now, of course, we had uh, special forces and advisors there before, but that didn't really reach into our neighborhoods. But when they started sending units in in 65, a uh, kid I knew from the class of 65 at my high school was killed before I graduated and enlisted. I enlisted in the middle of my senior year. So Vietnam was becoming a reality real quick. It was in the news every night. And uh, once Americans started fighting pitched battles, then that was the story. So I was becoming more and more aware of it. The closer I was coming to participate in it, I was becoming aware of it. But I didn't know a great deal about it. I didn't need to know about it. I was going to be fighting for my country. Vietnam was just going to be a location in which I would be fighting for my country. That's the way I looked at it. I don't want to oversimplify it, but... Did it come down to kind of a freedom isn't free, kind of a T-shirt kind of approach to war at that time in your life? Oh, well, especially for teenagers. Yeah, we, we weren't the most articulate uh, members of our generation. My country right or wrong. Those slogans are easy to grab onto and easy to relate to and easy to repeat to to make it sound like you knew what you were talking about. But uh, like I said, it was just, it was for me, I was a simple kid and it was very simple. I wanted to serve my country. It's where serving was. So So you end up in Kantian. Am I saying it right? Kantian? Kantian, yeah. You end up in Kantian in the documentary, The Vietnam War. You talk about the fact that it's close to the demilitarized zone, the DMZ. Right, oh, just just south of the Z, yeah. Which you guys ended up calling the dead marine zone. If we went into the DMZ, we had to fight our way out. We always lost people if we crossed into the DMZ. And all the ground around Compton, it was just three little bare top hills. I think about 500 feet at its highest point, but it was the highest point for quite a ways so we could see into North Vietnam. So we were a thorn in the NVA side there. and There was a lot of fighting around Kantian. Even if they weren't fighting at Kantian, we were fighting because of Kantian because we had to hold that base. We had to have that high ground. So you were right on the front lines. I mean, you didn't you you ended up right in the thick of it from day one? I was an infantry rifleman. I was exactly what I wanted to be. That's what I joined the Marine Corps to be. That's what I volunteered to do. And I uh, had no idea what exactly it was going to mean because the, the movies and all the books I read, it just didn't sink into me how absolutely terrifying and horrifying it was going to be. But it was the cost of serving my country, and it was a cost I was willing to pay. It's funny, when we looked at Vietnam, the government, the military, I don't know, the establishment, the system, whatever, was looking for measuring victory in terms of NVA killed, right? They were just counting bodies. It wasn't about the acquisition of land, because you'd take a hill, and you'd kill everybody on it, or they would retreat, and then you would just give the hill up. Is that right? That's right. Uh, the ink was still wet on my high school diploma, and I knew that's not how you win wars. That's how you lose wars. War is a real estate business. Always has been, always will be. I don't care how much meat you stack. You've got to hold ground. It's like uh, saving Private Ryan. We land on the beaches of Normandy, and we fight our way across Europe until the Germans are backed into a corner and they have one of two choices. They can die in place or they can surrender. We never fought it to win because it's a real estate business. We fought it to lose by bastardizing the definition of victory. When you say that victory is determined by the amount of meat you stack, then you're going to lose. For one thing, It leads to falsification of reports. For another thing, it leads to padding, which leads to things like me lie. It's not a good philosophy. 
Now, real fast, uh, let me digress for those who aren't familiar. Me Lai was an incident where a specific battalion led by a guy named William Kelly Jr. went and executed up to 500 unarmed people. So this is this rogue battalion, and they killed men, women, children, infants. Some of the women were gang raped, their bodies mutilated. 26 soldiers were charged with criminal offenses. Only Cali got prison time. So it was kind of a lightning rod of controversy. And that specific atrocity done by this specific battalion was for many seen as a microcosm of the larger Vietnam War. Robert McNamara, yeah. former Secretary of Defense, yeah. was talking about yeah. how, in retrospect, he was interviewed by Errol Morris for a film called The Fog of War, about sure. the lessons that he had learned. Specifically, he addressed Vietnam, and he was saying, if we had understood the North Vietnamese, we wouldn't have been there. Meaning they had a mentality that they weren't going to give up. They saw the United States as occupiers, and they were willing to die to the last man. Do you think that's an accurate assessment? If, you know, leadership, before we allow them to commit our kids into a war, we should demand that they take classes on the history and culture of the people they want our kids to kill. Because you learn a whole lot. We would have learned that the Vietnamese people had been fighting invaders for a couple of thousand years. And we would have learned that no matter what we did in that war, we could. We used to joke about, we're just going to pave the country and turn it into a parking lot for our jets. Or another joke was, take all the people that are, that are uh, against us and all the civilians and put them on ships and put the ships out in the ocean and then sink the ships. I don't care if we to turn the place into a parking lot for our jets. As long as there was a Vietnamese alive who knew his culture and his history, he was going to be killing Americans because we were invaders. We were just like the Chinese uh, had invaded them I can't remember how many times I used to know, but it, uh, we were the Japs. We were the French. We were just another foreigner bringing his weapons into their land and interrupting their lives. And I just don't believe that uh, you could win a war without wiping out the population in a country like that. Talking here with John Musgrave, Marine, Vietnam veteran. He's written a book called Notes to the Man Who Shot Me, Vietnam War Poems. He's working on another project. I'll get to that in just a few. You were horribly wounded in Vietnam. Can we talk yes, about that? Last, uh, uh, sure. It was, uh, it was a, a bad, it was an ambush, uh, which most of our fights with the North Vietnamese Army, they initiated by ambushing us. We had a new lieutenant, a new captain, and they used a trick as old as Custer to, to suck my platoon off the flank. We were on the right flank of a company in movement. And in order to get their bodies, they showed three NVA showed themselves and fired off a full magazine of their AKs and then ran deeper into the bush. And it's all about body count. So the radio, the orders were, I want their bodies. We told the lieutenant, don't do this. This, You're going to kill us, lieutenant. It's an ambush waiting to happen. But Marines follow orders. We don't kill officers. We don't kill our NCOs because we don't like the orders they give us. And... We pursued them, and they maneuvered us, just like they had a ring in our nose, into a position that, according to the after-action report, which I didn't see until like 48 years after the fight, my platoon made contact with a reinforced battalion of the North Vietnamese Army. And within moments, we had uh, 19 wounded and, and one dead out of one platoon. I was one of the first people shot. The guy that shot me... Had been fighting Marines for a long time. He knew that we never leave our wounded. And that's when I became his mate. 
and they shot and killed the first Marine that came out and got me and wounded at least one other. I think maybe two others were wounded before he was killed. And somehow we broke out of the fight. Now, I'm not a real good witness to this fight because I'm laying there with a, a tunnel blown through my chest. The second burst I took in the chest from an RPD light machine gun. But my memories are episodic. They're in chunks. I remember being drugged through the jungle. Uh, two of my buddies, one on each wrist, dragging me through the jungle and being pursued by the North Vietnamese. And when the NBA would get too close, my buddies would drop me. They knew I was dying, by the way. You don't survive the kind of wounds I had. I knew I was dying. I told them to leave me. They wouldn't do it. They would cover my body with theirs and fire back at the NVA. Years later, I was talking to my former platoon commander. He'd been XO of the company on the day we were ambushed. He wasn't our, if he'd have been platoon commander on that day, we never would have gotten in that ambush. He was a, just an extraordinary infantry officer. And I asked him, how did we get out of that ambush? They had us. He said, they let you out. They gave you an avenue of retreat because they wanted you to burden the company with the casualties. They knew if they let the survivors out of that ambush site, we would take our wounded with us, which is exactly what they did. It allowed what was left of my platoon, third platoon, to fight its way back to the company perimeter. Well, now the company saddled with all these casualties and is calling in helicopters. And that's what the NVA wanted. They wanted the helicopters. So I have no doubt Lieutenant McGee was correct. They knowingly gave us an avenue of escape so we would burden the company. And then when the helicopters came in, they shot the shit out of the helicopters. They threw me on the, the first bird. I think it was the first bird that landed to siege 34, the old... Old helicopters the Marine Corps had been using forever that always worked. And I couldn't hear because the the engine's actually in the front of that helicopter, but the transmission was right over our head with the rotors. So I couldn't hear, but I could see holes appearing in the sides of the helicopter. And uh, Lieutenant McGee had been holding me in his arms, telling me that they told the helicopter not to land, but he said, those are Marines down there. I'm coming to get them. And uh, that's one more reason why I survived. Were you lucid at this point? You're aware yeah, of what's happening? I, uh, I had to be. I had to keep myself conscious and breathing or I would die. And I'm breathing in a little gasp because my left lung's out. It's gone. It shot top right off yet. And my, I had already accepted that I was a dead man. But I thought I've got to stay alive as long as I can to pray for my family. Because hmm. I knew it was going to be much harder on them than it was on me. And then they triaged me at the company. Uh, when we got back into the company perimeter, the senior corpsman looked at me and says, there's nothing I can do for this man. And threw me on the helicopter, and the medic on the helicopter stood over me and bent over to look down at me. And looked up at the crew chief and shook his head emphatically no and then jerked his thumb off to the side and they and I knew what he meant he said I had this this guy's dead I can't help him and shoved me under the feet of the port side gunner and the port side gunner reached his hand down to try to push me flat on the deck but you learn in first aid training before you ever leave Camp Pendleton that when you're shot in the chest you put the gunshot wound to the ground. You you tip up to let gravity force the blood out of you. If you're laying on your back, the blood's not going to get out. It's going to fill your good lung and you're going to drown. Or it will build up around your heart and it'll seize your heart. So I was forcing myself up on my shoulder, on my left shoulder, so that I could get the blood to gravity to help keep me alive and the portside gunner is pushing me down 
thinking he's helping me. And I can't talk to him. Like I said, it was so loud I couldn't even hear the bullets that I could see coming through the sides of the bird. But I I grabbed his hand, and my left arm is useless, but I grabbed his hand with my right hand, and then I pointed at my chest, and he got the message. And he was firing his M60 with one hand and holding my right hand with his left. And on the flight back to Dong Ha, every time I started to fade, he would grab my, he was already holding my hand, but when my grip would loosen, he would squeeze my hand real hard and bring me back. Because if I go unconscious, I'm going to die. You don't get morphine because that retards your respiratory system. So you just got to eat the pain. They triaged me again at Dong Ha, which, which is, they look at casualties. Triage is when the medical, senior medical person, uh, person is eyeballing the casualty and says, I could save this man, and then tells him what to do to save him. Or if I try to save this man, I may lose him, but I will lose all these other men if I waste time on this guy with no guarantee I could save him. Well, I was that guy. And they were looking at me and realizing that they probably couldn't save me. And if they worked on me, it would be at the cost of someone that they could save. I understood. I knew what triage was all about. I knew what they were doing. And sure, I got my hopes up each step of the journey. But when they got me at Delta Med and they triaged me, and I'm talking to the guy. He looks at me and says, what's your religion? And I said, uh, I'm a Protestant, Doc. And he, and he looks up and he yells, get this man a chaplain. There's nothing I can do for him. And then he walked away. And I thought, oh, I guess this is it. And then another doctor walked by, and I happened to catch his eye. All I can tell you about him is he was redheaded. That's all I know. Don't know his rank because he was wearing a bloody T-shirt. That's all he had on but he was a doctor, and I was raised to be cordial to strangers. You always acknowledge him. So when he looked at me, I nodded and smiled at him, and this chaplain standing behind me, praying over me, and I'm just waiting to run out of gas. And this young doctor rushed to my side and said, why isn't somebody helping this man? And that began my journey to survival. They still would work on me at that hospital. Uh, myself and another guy in my squad, he was shot in the right side of the chest. They put us on a C-130 and flew us. As far as I know, we were the only two guys, two enlisted Marines in a big-ass four-engine transport aircraft, flew us to Fubai at Alpha Med. And they had a specialist waiting for us in Fubai. We each had a corpsman changing out the blood bags because as quick as they'd pump it in, it'd pump right out. But, you know, I had to go to another hospital to to literally be operated on and, and to complete the save. So it was a long day. It was a, it was a, it was a tough day for, you know, I was 19 and I was getting pretty old. When they put you out, did you think, well, you know, when I close my eyes, this will be it. Like, I won't wake yeah. up. Absolutely. I knew I had done everything I could do for what I believed, so I was prepared to die. I knew I had prayed for my family as long as I could, and I remembered a verse from the Bible that they used to read every Easter about the crucifixion, and when they got me into the operating room, and uh, they were getting ready to put me under, I said, Okay, God, into your hands I deliver my spirit. And then I thought I'd, I died. So I was more surprised than anybody when I opened my eyes and there was a Catholic chaplain there reading. I think he might have been last rites, but I don't know, because I was wearing a St. Christopher medal. I had my dog tags in my pocket. They hadn't found my dog tags yet. And uh, so they thought I was Catholic. Uh, I was wearing the St. Christopher medal for our next-door neighbor whose son was killed in World War II. Uh, she gave it to me just before I left for Vietnam. There's a photograph of you, John. It's a black-and-white photograph of you. You're lying in a bed. You've got a big bandage all over your chest. You're smiling. Yeah. Can you describe the photograph for me? What's happening? Uh, I 
Leonard and I were being decorated. Uh, we were being decorated by the commanding general of the 3rd Marine Division, General Bruno Hockman, uh, who had been in command of the Marine Corps Recruit Depot when I was uh, in boot camp uh, just uh, literally a year before. And uh, the gentleman on the other side of the rack, the one who's actually holding my hand, is the Vietnamese general in command of Northern Tactical Corps 1, which we called I Corps. And uh, General Hockbooth was giving us our Purple Hearts, and uh, the Vietnamese general decorated both of us with the Cross of Gallantry with the Gold Star. When I talk about the changing of perceptions, this is where I'm going. At the time, before and during your wound, hell, even right after your wound, what was your perception of war protest and war protesters back home? I know that you read about them, you said, in Stars and Stripes, which is a publication right. produced within the Department of Defense. Not exactly objective right. reporting, right? Uh, no. But no, what's, no. what's your perception of the protests that were happening back home? Well, based on what we were seeing in Stars and Stripes and what we were hearing in the newspaper articles that our families were sending us, that they were blaming us for the war. We were being accused of being baby killers. I never killed a baby, and I don't know anybody that did, and being war criminals. So we saw pictures. When I left the States in January of 67, there wasn't much of a peace movement. But boy, in that year, they grew up a lot. And we were seeing pictures of them. They were waving the flag of our enemy. And we thought, you know, what the hell's wrong with them? You know, don't they realize we thought we were fighting for their right to say no. But here they are waving the flags of our enemy and holding up pictures of Ho Chi Minh. So uh, we weren't very open-minded about what they were doing. Had uh, Jane and, Fonda uh, already taken her trip over to North no, Vietnam? No, that was that that was later. She was still Barbarella Dust. <laughs> one of her main fantasies. <laughs> yeah, she was Barbarella. That, that, that yeah. betrayal came later. Yeah. So, I mean, you had no, you had a bad taste in your mouth about the, the very idea of war protest. Oh, absolutely. You know, I, I knew that citizens had the right to do these things. But I... I couldn't understand why we were being demonized. You know, it wasn't our war, but they were saying it was. That's weird. And I mean, that's a I, weird sentiment, John. You are putting your life on the line. You're pulling the trigger. You're in the thick of it. But you're also thinking, I'm not sure I know what all this is about. It's just my duty to pull the trigger. I mean, is that an oversimplification? No, no. It's, I mean, things are pretty simple. We used to have a saying that combat cuts through the bullshit real quick. You know, it was simple. It was life and death for us. But I mean, the idea of complicated when you studied the foreign policy implications, but that's not what we did. Your job wasn't to understand why I'm here, why my brothers in arms are here. My job is just to be here. To do what the commandant of the Marine Corps wants me to do and to serve my country as faithfully and honorably as I could simple. John, how were you treated when you got back? Disgracefully. Uh, they flew us first to uh, Scott Air Force Base in East St. Louis. And we were a plane load of teenage wreckage uh, Marines going to Great Lakes Naval Hospital. The Great Lakes Naval Hospital is north of Chicago. And Chicago is about, what, 30 minutes by jet from St. Louis? They kept us uh, there that night and all the next day, and then they flew us into Great Lakes Naval Hospital that night. And I couldn't understand why they were doing that. I'm still in critical condition. And they take us off, and the first thing I know is that when they carry me down that ramp, it's snowing, and and I started to cry. It it shocked me that I was crying, but, you know, I, I knew it didn't snow in Vietnam. I was really home. And since I was in critical condition, I'd have to go through a whole in-depth examination before they would put me on the ward. And uh, I asked the examining physician, I said, why did you wait till 10 o'clock at night to bring us in here? 
we could have come up any time during the day. And he sa- he told me, he says, it's for your protection. And I looked at him like, it was nuts. And I said, what the hell are you talking about? I'm home. I don't need protecting now. He said, look, we've had protesters lining the fence out here when we bring wounded in, screaming things at them. And we wanted to protect you from having to see that. And I thought, uh-oh, you know, this, this ain't the country I left. This wasn't a protest of the action itself. In that case, they were coming after you. That's what the doctor told us. Now, I never saw it. I was in uh, on the surgery ward, Ward 8 East, at Great Lakes Naval Hospital for a couple of months. Uh, so I never saw it. But when I went home on convalescent leave, then I started to experience um, that nobody ever spit on me. Uh, and I'm really grateful for that because I don't know how I would have handled it. But I know guys that were spit on and they had no reason to lie about it. Because I came home in the medevac circuit, I wasn't exposed to civilians literally right off the plane. I'd been in the States for a while before I was considered well enough to go home on convalescent leave. But in the airports and just walking around my hometown, uh, people would shout things at me, uh, usually from a moving car, which told me everything I needed to know about their courage, the courage of their convictions. Uh, And uh, I had Kids I'd gone to school with and known all my life. Asked me how many babies I killed, and, and uh, I realized that you know things have changed. Uh, things changed a whole lot. Was it sort of uh, perceived that you know these are just the you know the free love kids, the you know the the hippies versus the military culture? Am I correct in that? Yeah. See, we didn't know what hippies were. When we left, anybody with long hair, we were on the West Coast, uh, we called them surfers. The first time we knew about hippies was in a Playboy article. A girl, one of the guy's girlfriends sent him a Playboy, and it had a photo essay in it about Hate ashbury because the girls ran around without their tops on. So there was lots of pictures. And we thought that it was called hip eyes because it was H-I-P-P-I-E-S. So we thought hip eyes and make love, not war. Hey, man, we, we've been doing a lot of war. We've not much making love. We'd like to try the other end of this. We didn't realize that that was going to be the foundation of uh, the resistance to us. The, the demonizing process was these these kids, my generation, they were learning about the war, it wasn't an intellectual endeavor, it was an emotional exercise. And they they accused us because we were obvious. And they could justify it by saying, well, it doesn't matter what you think, you're a part of the killing machine. So it didn't matter if a guy was, was a garbage man in the Navy or a cook in the Army he was still a war criminal because he was a part of the killing machine. I mean, oversimplification, but it was, that was the logic we were banging into. I got transferred to Quantico, Virginia and a wonderful small hospital there. And I was uh, assigned a weapons training battalion. I was a rifle and pistol coach and I was a very proud Marine and I would wear my uniform to Washington, D.C. the first time, a few times I went up there because I wanted to see the, where my government was. And I had an experience where I was standing at an intersection waiting for a light to change and a beautiful young woman walked up beside me and I'm eyeballing her because it had been a long war. And she, I mean, I got all my ribbons on and I'm hobbling so it's obvious that uh, I'm a casualty she said very sweetly, were you wounded in Vietnam? And I replied very proudly, yes, ma'am, I was. And then her face changed, and she screamed, I wish you'd been killed. And, I mean, she couldn't have hurt me more if she'd have hit me. 
I was stunned at the at the vehemence of the attack and totally unprepared for it. And she light changed and she walked across the street. I'm still standing there because I'm I am literally speechless as if I got sucker punched. And I remember thinking right then that I missed Vietnam. In just a second, we will delve into the next chapter of John's story. A sort of serious change in his own attitudes about protest and and how that has changed his life and pretty much everything he's done as a counselor and activist over the past several decades. Please join me for the second half of my conversation with Vietnam War veteran John Musgrave right after this. I have a confession. I used to love Rush Limbaugh. I used to read Ann Coulter. I got almost all of my news about the world from a single network, Fox News. I used to be a Fox News Christian. I was the God and Guns guy, the anti-gay agenda guy. I was the America will always be number one guy. I was the Christian nation guy. I used to believe that the United States belonged to me and my God. I was totally freaked out by the liberals and secular humanists. Ironically, today I am a liberal and secular humanist. My new book, Confessions of a Former Fox News Christian, chronicles my years as a right-winger. It examines the forces behind the Fox phenomenon. It dissects a culture of propaganda, conspiracy, and a Christian nationalist narrative. And it takes a hard look at the many problems with the highest-rated news network in the U.S., and a loyal audience that seems to watch it religiously. Get my book, Confessions of a Former Fox News Christian, today in paperback. It's in hardcover. It's on Kindle. The Audible version releasing late August. I think you're going to find it compelling and entertaining. Details and the links to order are at my personal website, SethAndrews.com. That's SethAndrews.com. Thank you so much for listening today. We're talking about patriotism and protests, specifically profiling the story of Vietnam War veteran John Musgrave. Terribly wounded in Vietnam, vilified by many war protesters, kind of trying to find his footing back here in the United States. I continue my conversation with John Musgrave here. Did you ever fully recover from your wound as one, I mean, physically? What's your condition, no, my uh, friend? I'm uh, permanently disabled. But you tried to re-enlist anyway. Oh, absolutely. I, I tried not to be medically retired. Uh, but uh, Marine Corps was was very kind to me. They, they didn't give me a medical discharge. They gave me a medical retirement, which allowed me to keep my military medical insurance so I didn't have to depend on the VA. I could go to civilian doctors. I could use military hospitals. I could still fly anywhere in the world for free on military aircraft. They they said, that we're giving you this package. We're retiring you as a corporal as if you did 20 years as our way of thanking you for your honorable service and the sacrifice you made for your country and for your corps. It was a wonderful thing, and I've I've always been grateful and proud that I'm a retired Marine. But when you re-enlisted or attempted to, was was it an escape? Was it a fuck you to the protesters? What's going on in your mind? It's the only thing I knew how to do. You know, I was 17 when I joined. I come out and I don't want to be in that society. I'm, I, I feel like a foreigner in my own country. And I, I understood combat. You know, like I said, cuts through the bullshit. You're either alive or you're dead. Things are dictated. Your conduct is dictated by your sense of honor. And I hungered to still be a part of that system, that honor system. In the Marine Corps, I wasn't 21 yet, but 
I was a non-commissioned officer. I'd been decorated. I was treated with respect. Uh, when they put me on the street, I wasn't old enough to vote for the bastards that sent me to war, and I wasn't considered responsible enough to drink a beer. I was just another snot-nosed punk. I went to the Marine Corps to get away from that bullshit. So, yeah, I missed it. You ended up serving in another capacity, right? Oh, well, yeah, I've always tried to maintain my service to my country. Uh, and there are a lot of ways to serve your country. Um, the Marine Corps had me speaking to community groups when I was coming home from the hospital on convalescent leaves. And later when I would come home on my regular leave, they 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 knew I, I was uh, comfortable talking in front of groups. And they would give me, I said, all we want you to do is portray a positive image of the Vietnam veteran and the United States Marine Corps. Well, hell yeah, I'll do that. But that's when I still fought. I, I had a chance to beat this injury. Uh, uh, and when I got, got the retirement and I looked at myself, uh, not as a disabled veteran, but I looked at myself as a cripple. And in the generation I grew up in, a cripple's not a man. So I did what I'd never done before. I started drinking. And that's the way I dealt with my pain for a couple of years. I started college. And I had to deal with the anti-war sentiments on the campus. And... Unlike a lot of my friends, I know a lot of Vietnam veterans that say, man, as soon as I got home, I burned my uniform or I stuck it in the closet. I was in the, asked to the student union by campus veterans. And this is a very small college, so it's a, just a handful of vets. Most of them were Army National Guard reservists, hadn't been to Vietnam. But they were they were looking out for me. They wanted to help me out. And they gave me advice on how to fit in. They said, let your hair grow. Don't wear anything that uh, identifies you with the military. And for God's sake, don't talk about it. And I thanked them for their time and, and for their intentions. And I walked right out of the student union and got my MG and roared back to Missouri. Went down to my folks' basement, opened my sea bag, got my... Uh, field jacket out, my jungle boots, and my jungle jacket. Before, I'd always worn a collared shirt, slacks, and wingtips to class. That was my civilian uniform. But by God, everybody was talking to me like I was supposed to be ashamed of my service. And I was thinking like a Marine non-commissioned officer. I ain't ashamed of shit. Nobody's going to make me feel like it. So from then on, I wore my field jacket if it was cold and my jungle jacket if it was warm. And they could, I did, you know, they, you could take me as I am or you could kiss my ass. But I am a Marine and a Vietnam veteran and I ain't ashamed of it. Deal with it. So I had a real adversarial relationship with most of the students that I was with at the time. But small campus, you have to deal with people. When you're on a small campus, you can't deal with things, you know. And uh, people started listening to what I had to say. I got asked to speak. Uh, they had the first moratorium. I'm fresh in college, and it's October 1969, the first national moratorium. I don't know how old you were then, but this was a big deal. So I walked up. It was raining that day in Kansas, so they were holding the moratorium protest in the uh, auditorium because they didn't want to get wet. Made me giggle a little bit. I thought, God, you guys would have loved the monsoon season. Mm. But outside, some of the guys from the local legion and, and some of the students who had relatives in the military were carrying American flags and that had signs on the staff so that I support the troops in Vietnam. And as I walked by on my way to class, one of them said, hey, Gunny, you want to a flag, and I said, hell yeah. So I took it, and I started walking with them out in front of the auditorium, and some students that I knew, and I'd been talking to, that I knew were opposed to the war, and then we 
could talk as equals with respect to one another, came out and asked me if I wanted to come in and address the moratorium. And I thought, yeah, hell yeah, I'll do it, you know. And I was expecting to get a lot of shit. So I walked in with the flag. I still got the flag. And I walk up on stage, and I'm looking at these kids, and I thought about it when I was walking in. I'm thinking, well, what am I going to say? Oh, I'm going to tell them to kiss my ass or something, you know, be Mr. Hardcore Marine here. But when I got up and stood in front of them, I'm looking down in that audience. I know most of these kids, and they're decent kids. And I, I started off by saying, I want you to understand something. In Vietnam are a bunch of kids just like me, and I guarantee you, we thought we were fighting for your right to do this, and we don't understand why you're blaming us for this war. I said, it is not our war. It's our fight, because we want to stay alive. But it's not our war. If you want to blame somebody, you blame the guys of Washington, D.C. It's their war. We're just a bunch of kids doing our jobs. We are not war criminals. We're not Nazis. We're not killing babies. Of course, me lie had come out. So there were some that were just couldn't get beyond that. I said, if you really want to change minds about this war, I've got a lot of buddies that are in country right now, and I'll give you their address, and you write them a letter and explain to them why you're opposed to the war and why you don't blame them. I said, I'll give you a list of things you can send them that they need that they'll appreciate, socks and fruit cocktail and applesauce. And I said, to show them that, that you, you're not against them. And that was my whole spiel. I didn't try to talk about it being against the war. I just tried to talk about being against us. And as I turned to walk off the stage, I got a standing ovation from these kids. And this is the anti-war movement at my college. And it changed both of us. It changed my attitude about stereotyping them and it changed their attitude about stereotyping me. What they didn't realize is that after President Nixon gave his withdrawal speech, which basically said, I don't have the guts to quit this, but we're not going to win it. We're going to lose, but I'm going to keep making these poor kids die for me. The withdrawal was just telling the North Vietnamese, I give up. By the way, you keep killing these poor kids. I don't care about that. Let's talk about that, John. I want to go back to something yeah. that you said when it came to the taking of a life, right? the killing of an NBA. Yeah. You had killed your first man and you were riddled with guilt. You were yes. just wrought with pain over the idea. And you yeah. found a way through that or you found a way to deal with that that i i just it stuck with me can you in your words describe how you shifted your mindset and the implications of doing that the i only killed one human being in vietnam and that was the first man i shot and i was confronted with his humanity because he was very close to me and i watched him die and it was a horrible experience. All my cowboy heroes killed people. All my cop heroes killed people. All my secret agent heroes killed people. You know, I'd watch thousands of people get killed before I went to Vietnam. I had a TV. I went to the movies. And the message was inescapable. Real men kill people. I was looking forward to it. But when I was confronted with it, it wasn't what I had expected. I didn't feel cool. I didn't feel good. I was sickened by it. Two days later, I saw my first Marine die. And he stepped on a bouncing Betty mine. And that's the day I made my deal with the devil. And I swore, I will never kill another human being as long as I am here. However, I'm going to waste every gook I find. 
I'm going to wax every dink I come across. I'm going to smoke every zip I see. But I ain't going to kill anybody. You know, I mean, it's just, it's just, I had come to despise my community for its racism. Because I, I grew up watching people being beaten and having dogs turn loose on them just trying to register to vote. Just to register to vote. I saw that on TV and I listened to the things that people were saying in my community and and it sickened me. Because I believed in this country. But now I'm in a jam. I'm in a real jam. I need to be able to kill these people and not have it tear my guts out. So I fell back on what I thought I despised. I fell back on racism. I didn't think of it as racist at the time, but it, it's what it was. It's turning subjects into objects. And like I said, we didn't even say we killed them. Uh, we wasted them. Or waxed them or smoked them or zapped them. Or we had all kinds of names for it. Isn't that the story but, of human history, right? We tribalize oh, sure. ourselves I mean, and we dehumanize absolutely. the other, right? Even World War II, when they were fighting guys of the same religion and looked just like them. They didn't call the Germans, I mean, they called them Krauts and Huns and Squareheads and Nazis, anything that they could de to dehumanize them. We're civilized people. We're raised civilized, and most of us are raised in the Christian faith. We are not raised to kill people. So we have to adapt in order to do it. I mean, it's one thing to have to kill one person in your life. But it's another thing when it's your fucking job. It's a day at the office. You not only have to be able to do it, you have to find a way to be comfortable doing it. You uh, talked about how scared you were, right? You hated him and was, you were terrified. I was terrified. Absolutely terrified. I, w I wish I could tell you I was a hero, but I wasn't. I was terrified the whole time I was there. You mentioned that you slept with a, a nightlight for at yeah. least a period of time. Is that right? No, I still do. I'm scared of the dark. And there's a point. It's the part of the documentary with Ken Burns that I just about choked up was when you talk about your children. Dad, yeah. why can't we sleep with a nightlight? You know, we're growing up. How come daddy sleeps yeah. with one, right? It's exactly right. They, they put mom on the spot. Well, over a million North Vietnamese Army NBAs died in Vietnam. We don't talk about them very much, do we? No. They were genuine hard dicks, man. They were, they were good soldiers. I, I was proud that I fought them. We respected them. We hated them. Uh, we killed every last swing and dick we could find, but, but uh, there was a, a respect for them. When did you come to a point when you started to rehumanize the enemy? Oh, that took a long time uh, because I wasn't ready to have the conversation with myself that I had been killing people. You know, I had I had to keep them as an enemy uh, to keep them at at arm's length from me. Uh, so it was. It took a few years before I could allow myself. To consider that, uh, I was in the 1990s when I wrote notes to the man who shot me. Um, I got my loyalty to my buddies, my dead buddies, all tangled up with hatred for the NVA. And I convinced myself that I couldn't uh, forgive the NVA because they killed my buddies, that it would be disloyal to my buddies if I forgave them. And I, you know, I mean, my hate in the NBA didn't hurt them. They, they didn't care. They didn't know. They didn't care. Uh, and my buddies wouldn't want me to live like that. The only person who hurt was me. 
and it just created a great deal of turmoil in my life and got in the way of, of he, he, my healing. And so when I wrote notes to the man who shot me, intellectually, I accepted their humanity and I I told myself that I'd been humping this rucksack filled with rocks for all these years. It was weight I didn't need to carry. All it was was holding me back. And that those rocks, the, the symbolism of those rocks was, was the, the weight of the hatred that I had nurtured all those years. I'm glad you made it that far. You talked about a time when, you know, you're looking for a way to numb the pain at the bottom of a bottle and who knows what yeah. else. And you've got a loaded pistol in your hand, right? Pistol. Yeah. Yeah. I came, I was suicidal for a long time. There's a photograph of you from 1972. I didn't even recognize you, John. You know, you've got hair well down and your, you know, your beard's grown out and you are, yeah. you're kind of a, you're a hip eye, if I may. Right? Yeah. There you go. How yeah, did, how did this happen? Bed, anyway. How did that happen, my friend? Well, uh, the longer I tried to justify the war, I try, I, I studied so I could be prepared to, to argue the point. And uh, the more I looked, the less I could find to justify w what we were doing there. So then I thought, well, shit, I'm just going to, I got to, I got to get away from this. This is going to drive me nuts. So I just drank more. Well, I quit drinking and, uh, that cleared my head up some. And, uh, I was looking through a magazine and there was a full page ad in it. And it was a picture of a flag covered casket. And it said the, the true cost of the Vietnam war. And it, said, if you're a Vietnam veteran and you don't think the war is right, send this into this address. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to check this out because it said Vietnam veterans against the war. I was never going to help the peace movement. Never. They were still waving the NVA flags and still cheering Ho, Ho, Ho Chi Minh. I had you know, I'm not going to walk with the guys that have called me a baby killer. But here are Vietnam veterans. So I sent the thing in. And I start getting information from them. And they're going to have a protest in Washington, D.C. in April 1971. Just Vietnam veterans. And uh, I didn't want to do it. The uh, coward in me. I realized that if I came out against the war, that I was going to hurt a lot of people that had stayed loyal to the uh, idea of the war simply because I'd been in it. I was going to hurt my folks. I was going to piss off my community. All those World War II and Korean veterans that I had grown up in their shadow and I had enlisted and volunteered to fight because I wanted to step out of their shadow and stand beside them as a brother, I was going to hurt them and they were going to be angry with me. I realized that if I went public with my feelings about this war, that I was going to have to pay a price that I wasn't sure if I had the courage to pay. The more I thought about it, the more I realized my duty as a citizen of the United States left me no choice. This wasn't about me. This wasn't about me being comfortable. This wasn't about me being popular. This was about me continuing to serve my country in the best way that I could. And I realized that I had no right to hide my opposition to the war any longer. That's an interesting uh, idea for a lot of people. It was for me 20 years ago. The idea of protesting yeah. an action that's taking place looks like 
it's traitorous. It's betrayal. Once the first trigger is pulled, man, you don't protest a war. You stand behind. What's that? Yeah. Another T-shirt that says, if you won't stand behind our troops, then go stand in front of them, right? There you go. But in the larger picture, to protect human life and to stand against injustice, right? A war that we could not win. We didn't fully understand. Hell, we didn't even marginally understand. The exactly. patriotic thing to do was to go and protest, right? And the president had already told the world, we're not even going to stay in this war. And more American soldiers died during Nixon's withdrawal than died during Johnson's buildup. And I thought that was wrong because I know who those kids were. They were just like me. They're poor and working class. If their parents had money, they were on a college campus. They weren't wearing a uniform slogging around the jungles of Vietnam. They didn't give a shit about us. That's why they shoved us into the front lines and and altered the laws to the draft to where they could literally draft functionally disabled working class and poor kids so they wouldn't have to touch the middle class and upper class. And I had fucking had it with that. And I realized that if I was ever going to be able to look at myself in the mirror again, this was one injustice that I had addressed. To protest because you love your country, right? I mean, Absolutely. there's a culture that doesn't get, will never get it. And I think this yeah. was the evolution in my own mind. You know, when I was a kind of a hardcore, coddled, absolutely insulated, cocooned young man in peaceful yeah. America. And I uh, had this binary view of what patriotism was and what love of country was yeah. and what the dutiful thing was. And yeah. um, you went through a, an extreme evolution in your own thinking. Yes, I did. So what's it like out there? I mean, when you're standing among the protesters, what's going on in your head? Uh, I knew I was going to conduct myself as I did in the Marine Corps. I was not going to do anything that I would consider dishonorable. I would not do anything that was disloyal. But if a war ain't worth winning, it ain't worth fighting. And I was going to do everything I could to stop it within those limitations. I was bound by my own sense of honor uh, that would limit what I would do. And I ended up being a national organizer for Vietnam Veterans Against the War. On a couple of occasions, I was the spokesman for the organization nationally. When you saw John Kerry give his testimony back in, I think it was 1971. I was in the room. You were standing I was in at the, the back. room when he did it. Yeah, in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And well, Kerry, at the time, had said some extremely controversial things to the Senate Committee on yeah. Foreign Relations. He was accusing soldiers of day to day crime, rape, dismemberment, baby killing. You'd mentioned that. Did he yeah. misrepresent the what fighting he, Marine? What he was doing was referencing testimony made by Vietnam veterans at the Winter Soldier investigation in Detroit, which this happened before I joined VVAW, where men felt two things. Some of them felt Lieutenant Cowley is, getting, uh, is being made to pay for the sins of a nation. And the other one saying, look, this was SOP in our unit, and if you don't think this is right, then you ought to end the war, because this is what we're doing. And they testified to some pretty hard shit. I was really grateful when I saw films of a lot of that testimony. Uh, for a couple of those guys, I knew they were absolute bullshitters. I mean, God gave me a nose so I could smell bullshit, and I could smell it through the film <laughs> on a couple of those guys. But others of those guys were with guy, other guys from their unit. I mean, there was they were telling the stories there are witnesses for, and I'm just thinking, what I was thinking was, thank God I wasn't in that unit. But I was lucky that when I was up north, we were fighting in a free fire zone, so I didn't have to worry about civilians. But those guys that were fighting down there in heavily populated areas, that was a whole different war. So 
while he was saying things that did not reflect my personal experience, I knew what he was referencing. And I thought, you know what, America, if you're going to cheerlead for this war, you need to know what you're cheerleading for. I've heard it said and that so, um, the people who send Americans to war should volunteer their own children kind of thing. Like, how right. often do we see the people in the halls of power thousands of miles removed making decisions that really have no emotional impact or familial impact yep. on them? One thing I'll say for Johnson, he had girls, but they had husbands, and he made sure both of them went to Vietnam. Nixon had girls, and he made sure his his little boys stayed home. In the years after all this, you know, the Vietnam War finally ends, and it ends yeah. tragically, meaning it ends with nothing really being solved, right? I mean, I, yeah. nothing of note really came of that decade outside of the death of over 2 million human beings. Would you agree yeah. or disagree with that? Well, uh, this is a matter of perspective. To uh, the common everyday peasant in South Vietnam, when the shooting and the bombing stopped, he didn't give a shit who was in charge. He was just glad that it was over and felt more comfortable with a Vietnamese telling him what to do than some foreigner. So for them, the, the end of the war, they didn't give a shit if it was a communist in Hanoi or not. They just wanted to be able to farm their fucking rice and live their life and raise their children without having to worry about being killed while doing it. So the war did come to an end. It just didn't come to the end that our politicians wanted it to. And it didn't come to the end that we were told was what we were fighting for. But since they never, in the final analysis, it was tough to realize they never intended to win it. And they just bullshitted us. All you got to do is look at the strategy and the tactics to answer that question. Back to Bob McNamara, he's saying that, you know, as we move forward into various military conflicts here and there across the world, we may not be learning the lessons that we should have learned at Vietnam. Do you have any thoughts on that? We try very hard never to learn any lessons. We are not a nation that spends a great deal of time on uh, self-examination. And uh, we have, I speak in a lot of schools, both uh, high schools, colleges, even, even great schools on occasion. And I'm, I'm sad every time I realize how little history we're teaching our kids and how little history our average citizen is actually aware of. He can tell you more about his local football team than he can what his country's done in the last century and a half. It's unfortunate. You've been very generous with your time, and I'm so grateful for that. In the broad picture here, sort of coming to a close, the idea is that it's not un-American, it's not anti-patriotic to do the right thing, to try to protect life. Would that be uh, one of the lessons that we're trying to learn from your experience? I consider one of the most sacred duties of a citizen in a participatory democracy is the requirement that he stand up and say no to his government, his or her government, whenever they feel that they are not operating in the best interest of their people. This is a democracy, the hardest form of government to make function properly. And we can call it a democracy all we want, but if we're not participating, it ain't a democracy, it's something else. And the requirements of a citizen in a democracy is that he must stay well informed and must, absolutely must make informed decisions. It's supposed to be a government of the people, for the people, and by the people. Well, the people have to equip themselves with the information to be able to make informed decisions to fulfill their responsibility. 
in that of by and for. Does that make sense? It does. John, your story helped to open my mind, my friend. It just opened my perception so much. You are telling your story in a book that you are writing now that's going to be out who knows when. Can you tell me anything about it? Because I'm going to be on the lookout, right? It's uh, Kanoff Books. Uh, is going to publish it. I'm going through, as we speak, I've got the latest uh, transcript in front of me, as you were, manuscript in front of me, and it's going to be my autobiography. And uh, hopefully it'll be out uh, at least by the the Christmas season. Uh, they do a big publishing move around Christmas, so uh, supposedly when I get done with this manuscript, it's, it's supposed to go into production. So right now the working title is The Education of Corporal John Musgrave. I told him I didn't like that title. I wanted Gullible Travels. <laughs> and they could have the subtitle be the education of Corporal John Musgrave, but uh, it says in the contract that I don't get to choose the title. So Gullible's Travels. That's clever. Yeah. That's clever. That or War and Pieces. I thought that would be a good one, too. For those who want to find out more about John's journey, I encourage you to go to his personal website, johnmusgraveveteran.com. Uh, how you doing these days, my friend? I'm, uh, I've got a brand new granddaughter that's just if she gets any cuter, my heart's going to explode. Mm. Uh, she's uh, 14 months old now, and I'm just thrilled to be a grandpa. I'm getting ready for uh, rotator cuff surgery next week, which I'm ready. But uh, other than that, I'm doing great. John, you're a, you're a good man, and you're an inspiration to me. It's funny the people you encounter in your life. You know, you bounce around, and you end up meeting people, and you encounter what they are and what they're about. And and man, I'll just take this one with me for longer than than I could say. It's this has been a real honor for me, and I hope we've helped to open up some perceptions from other people who've sort of taken this journey with us. So, in the writing of the book, and your healing from surgery, and everything else, all my best to you and yours. Okay. Thank you, Seth. I appreciate it. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. For a complete archive of podcasts and videos, products like mugs and T-shirts featuring The Thinking Atheist logo, links to atheist pages and resources, and details on upcoming free thought events and conventions, log on to our website, thethinkingatheist.com.